Hello everyone and welcome back to the video lecture series for statistics. Today we are going to be starting on the branch of statistics called descriptive statistics and which is the stat which is the organization and display of data. And we're going to start with what are called frequency distributions and their corresponding graphs. So when we're representing quantitative data visually, it is important that we organize it in such a way that we can see some of its important characteristics. So we describe a data set by characteristics such as its center, what value is in the approximate middle, its variability or spread, how spread out is the data, is it all clustered around one value, is it all over the place, and its shape, is it skewed, is it somewhat symmetric, what does its shape look like. So when there is a lot of data, it can be really difficult to see patterns just by looking at the blob of numbers that is the data. So one way of organizing the data into more manageable pieces is to group the data into what are called intervals, which are also called classes. By grouping the data into classes, you create what is called a frequency distribution. A frequency distribution is a table that shows the classes or intervals of data entries with a count of the number of data entries that fall in each class. The frequency, which is denoted by the variable lowercase f, the frequency of a class is the number of data entries in that class. So frequency distributions are organized into what are called frequency tables. A frequency table has the following characteristics. There are no gaps or overlaps between any of the classes. All data entries in the original data between the minimum and the maximum values must be accounted for and it is inclusive because the minimum and the maximum data entry and every data entry in between must be accounted for in the classes somewhere. And to ensure that there is no bias when you are comparing the frequencies of different classes, all of the classes must be of equal size. Now each class has what is called a lower class limit and an upper class limit. The lower class limit is the lowest or smallest value that can belong to a particular class. The upper class limit is the greatest value that can belong to a particular class. And the class width is the size of each class. And since the classes must be of equal size, the class width is the same for each class. Now, class width is not the difference between the upper class limit and the lower class limit. The class width is the distance between the lower limits of consecutive classes or the upper limits of consecutive classes. So the class width is the distance between the lower limits of two consecutive classes, which mean two classes in a row. So this is an example of a very generic frequency distribution. We have the classes in one column and the frequencies in the other. So notice the, the first class goes from data entries one to five, and the frequency five means that in the original data set, which we don't have, but we don't need, in the original data set, there are five data entries that have a value between one and five. The second class is from six to 10, and it has a frequency of eight, which means that in the original data, there are eight data entries that have a value between six and 10. The next class goes from 11 to 15, and there are six data entries that fall in that class, and you get the idea. Now notice how the first class goes from 1 to 5, and the next class starts at 6. So there are no gaps between these two classes, and there is no overlap between these classes. So the second class goes from 6 to 10, and the third class starts at 11. There are no gaps or overlap between those two classes. And you can see how that is the case with all of them. So this is a properly made frequency table. Now the lower cl class limits are the smallest values that can belong to each class. So the lower class limit of the first class is 1. The lower class limit of the second class is 6. The lower class limit of the third class is 11. Next lower class limit is 16. Next one is 21. And the lower class limit of the last class is 26. The upper class limits are the largest values that can belong to each individual class. So the upper class limit for the first class is 5. The upper class limit for the second class is 10. Upper class limit for the third class is 15. And then the next one is 20, then 25, and 30. 
Now, the class width is the difference between the lower limits of consecutive classes. And if the frequency distribution is properly made, the class width should be the same for any pair of consecutive classes. So let's take a look at the first two classes. The first lower class limit is 1. The next lower class limit is 6. The difference between those is 5. Now, let's just make sure that that's going to be the same for all the classes. So if you take a look at the lower class limits from 6 and 11, the difference between 6 and 11 is 5. Difference between 11 and 16 is 5. Difference between 16 and 21 is 5. And the distance between 21 and 26 is 5. So since the distance between the lower limits of all the consecutive classes are 5, the class width is equal to 5. Now, just to point it out, look at the upper class limits. So let's take a look at the upper class limits of consecutive classes, 5 to 10. What do you notice about the distance between those? The distance between those is 5, which is the same as the class width. So the class width can also be thought of as the difference between the upper limits of consecutive classes. So 10 to 15 has a distance of 5. 15 to 20 is 5, and then 5, and 5, and so on. So couple other things about the frequency tables. The lower limit of the first class must be equal to the minimum value. So even though we don't have the original data in front of us, just looking at this lower limit of the first class, we know that the minimum or the smallest data entry is 1. The minimum is the, is the lower limit of the first class. Now, the upper limit of the last class may or may not be the maximum. So the upper limit of the last class must be greater than or equal to the maximum. The reason is because the classes need to all be of equal size. So 30 may or may not be the maximum. We don't know that. We don't have the original data in front of us. But we do know that the maximum needs to be in this last class somewhere. We do know that the maximum is somewhere between 26 and 30. So it is OK if the upper limit of the last class exceeds the maximum. That's fine. Because the classes need to be of equal size, this is going to happen more often than not. As long as the maximum is in that last class somewhere, it is OK if the upper limit of the last class overshoots the maximum. As long as the maximum is included, they're good to go. We're actually going to be learning how to construct one of these frequency distributions ourselves. So the first step is to either decide on the number of classes or like in most of your homework and exam questions, you will be told how many classes to make. So you will be told to make a frequency distribution for this data using n number of classes. Then you're going to, the first thing you're going to do then is find the class width. The class width, you can either think of it as a formula or you can think of it as the range of the data divided by the number of classes. So you determine the range of the data, which is the maximum data entry minus the minimum data entry. Then you're going to divide that by the number of classes. So if you want a formula, you can use this as a formula for class width. The maximum value minus the minimum value. Do that subtraction first. Then divide it by the number of classes. And we're going to be going by integers when we make these frequency distributions. So even if you get a decimal, you're always going to round up to the nearest whole number. Even if the number after the decimal point is like 0.2, if there's anything after the decimal point, round up to the next whole number. Because again, you need to make sure that that last class ha contains your maximum. So the more the better. It's OK to overshoot. So always round up no matter what's after that decimal point. Then you're going to find each of the class limits. You're going to start off with the minimum data entry, and you're going to use it as the lower class limit of the first class. Then to find the remaining lower class limits, you're going to add the class width to that minimum as many number of times as you need to get the number of classes you're supposed to have. Then you're going to find the upper limit of the first class, keeping in mind that it cannot have any gaps or overlaps between the first class and the second class. Then to find the rest of the upper class limits, you're going to keep adding the class width to that first upper class limit. Then once you have constructed the classes, you're going to find their frequencies. So you're going to go into the original data, and you're going to go one data entry at a time, and you're going to figure out what class it belongs to. And you're going to make a tally mark, and then 
at the end, you're going to add up all the tallies, and then that will be the frequency of that class. So for this, let's do one of those for this manageably sized data set. So this data set contains 30 GPS units. This 30 here is what is called the sample size. So this is a sample of 30, and we're going to keep in mind that there are 30 of these. And these numbers here are the prices in dollars of these 30 GPS units. And what we're going to do is we're going to construct a frequency distribution with seven classes. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to scan through the data and I'm going to find my minimum data entry and my maximum data entry. The minimum data entry is the smallest data entry that belongs here. So if you take a look, it looks like 65 is the smallest, so 65 is our minimum. Then we're going to go find the maximum data entry, which is the largest data entry. So if you take a look through this, 340 is the highest price listed here. Also, I'm very sorry about the random lines that are drawn through sometimes. I have, the stylus I'm using is pretty glitchy, and there's really nothing I can do about it. So I'm sorry about that, but we're just going to... You're going to see that a lot. In the, like I said, you're going to see that a lot in these videos, so we're going to do the best we can with it. Anyway, now that we figured out the minimum and the maximum, before we go constructing any classes, we need to figure out the class width. The class width is given by that formula, the maximum data entry minus the minimum data entry divided by the number of classes. So we're going to take the maximum data entry, which is 340. We're going to subtract from it the smallest, the minimum, 65. Then we're going to divide it by the number of classes, which we were told to make seven classes. So we're going to divide it by seven. So if you do 340 minus 65 and then divide it by seven on the calculator, it gives you approximately 39.29. And remember, if there's anything after that decimal point, you're going to round up to the next whole number. So we're going to round it up to 40. So the class width is going to be 40 for each of these classes. So then let's get the lower class limits, which just because I don't have a whole ton of room, I'm going to abbreviate by LCL, lower class limits. So the first lower class limit is going to be the minimum, 65. Then I'm going to add to it the class width of 40, which will give me 105. So 105 is going to be the lower class limit of the second class. Then to get the lower class limit of the third class, we're going to add the class with 40 again to get 145. So 145 is going to be the lower class limit of the third class. Then add 40 again to get 185, which is going to be the lower class limit of the fourth class. Then add 40 again, so 225 is going to be the lower class limit of the fifth class. Add another 40, we get 265. And then add another 40 and we get 305, which is going to be the lower class limit of the seventh and last class. Then we're going to find the upper class limits. So keep in mind that the first class starts at 65, but the second class starts at 105. So in order to make sure that there are no gaps or overlaps between these classes, if the second class starts at 105, the first class needs to end at 104. So that will mean that there are no gaps between these and there is no overlap. So then to find the upper class limits of the rest of the classes, we're going to add the class width. So add 40 and we get 144, so that'll be the upper class limit of the second class. Add another 40, we're going to get 184, which is going to be the upper class limit of the third class. We're extra glitchy today, I apologize. Then add another 40, we get 224 for the upper class limit of the next class, and then we get 264. Then we get 304, add another 40, and we get 344 for the upper class limit of the last class. Now, let's next turn this into an actual frequency table. So we're going to have the classes in one column. I'm going to have the tallies in its own column just so we can keep track of them. And then we're going to have the frequency, which I'm just going to denote by the variable f. So the first class, 
its lower class limit is 65 and the upper class limit is 104. So the first class is going to go between 65 and 104. Then the second class is going to start at 105 and it is going to end at the upper class limit of the second class, 144. Then the third class is going to go from 145 to 184. Fourth class is going to go from 185 to 224. Then the next class is going to go from 225 to 264. Then it's going to go from, oops, hold on, give me a second. All right, so I needed more room than that. So let's try that again. I'm a complete mess today, and I apologize. So anyway, oh my god. So we've got the classes in one column, and we have the frequency in the other column. So the first class is going to go from 65 to 104. Second class is going to go from 105 to 144. Third class is going to go from 145 to 184. Then the next class is going to go from 185 to 224. Then the next class is going to go from 225 to 264. Sixth class is going to go from 265 to 304. And the seventh and last class is going to go from 305 to 344. Keep in mind, you were told to make seven classes, so we need to make sure that there are only seven classes. So then to get the frequencies, what we're going to do is we're going to go back into this data and we are going to start making tally marks of where each of these data entries belong. So 128 for this first one. Well, 128 falls in the range between 105 and 144, so I'm going to make a tally there. 100 also falls in this inter in falls in the interval between 65 and 104, so I'm going to make a tally there. 180 falls in the interval between 145 and 184, so I'm going to put a tally there. 150 is from 145 to 184, so I'm going to make another tally, and you're going to get the idea. So the frequencies that you should get for each of these classes, the first class should have a frequency of 6, second one should have a frequency of 9, third one should have a frequency of 6, Fourth one should have a frequency of 4, frequency of 2, frequency of 1, and frequency of 2. So just on your, own, on your own, I want you to go through each of these, figure out what class they belong in. These are the frequencies that you should get. Now, to check your answers, to check whether or not you missed any, because I know for larger data sets it can be tough to figure out if you've missed any, just add up the frequencies. If you add up the frequencies, you should get the sample size. So that is a surefire way of knowing whether or not you missed any, is if you add up the frequencies and you get the sample size, you got them all. If you get greater than the sample size, you counted uh, one of them twice by accident. If you got less than the sample size, you missed one. So that's just a way to check to see if you got them all. Now, there are a bunch of other features that are of interest in a data set. One of them is called the class midpoint. So the class midpoint is the midpoint of the class, which is also called the class mark. And it is the average between the upper and the lower class limits of the same class. To find the average, you just take the lower class limit, you add to it the upper class limit, and then you divide by two. The midpoint is called that because it is the data entry that is in the exact middle of the class. So it is whatever is in the exact middle of that class. And you find midpoint by just taking the lower class limit, adding to it the upper class limit, and dividing by 2. Next feature of interest is called the relative frequency. The relative frequency is the portion or percentage of the total data that falls in that class. So relative frequencies are going to be given as decimals or percents. And it's just, okay, what percentage of the data falls in this particular class? Is it 25% of the data? Is it 50% of the data? What portion of the data falls in that class? So to find the relative frequency, you're going to take the individual class's frequency and you're going to divide it by the sample size.
The variable that we use for sample size is lowercase n. So in symbols, the relative frequency is the frequency f divided by the sample size lowercase n. By the way, we use lowercase n for sample size. We use uppercase n for population size. So there is a difference. And the next feature of interest is called the cumulative frequency. The cumulative frequency of a class is the sum of that class frequency and the frequency of all the classes that came before it. The cumulative frequency of the last class should be equal to the sample size n. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that same frequency distribution that we just made, and we're going to find the midpoint, the relative frequency, and the cumulative frequency of each class, and we're going to use that to make any conclusions. And we're going to use that and the original frequency table to draw conclusions about the data just based on the visuals. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to find the class midpoint. The class midpoint is found by averaging together the lower and the upper class limits. So to find the midpoint of this first class, what we're going to do is we're going to take the upper class limit and the lower class limit, add them together, and divide it by 2. So if you do 65 plus 104 divided by 2, you get 84.5. Then we're going to do the same thing for the next one. To find the class midpoint for the second class, we're going to take the lower class limit, 105. We're going to add to it the upper class limit, 144. And we're going to divide it by 2, and you get 124.5. Now, just for context, remember that these are prices of these GPS units. So this 84.5 for the first class means that a GPS that costs $84.50 would be in the exact middle of the first class. A GPS that costs $124.50 would be in the exact middle of the second class. So for the third class, which ranges from $145 to $184, we're going to average them together. So 145 plus 184 divided by 2 gives us a midpoint of 164.5. So a GPS that costs $164.50 would be in the exact middle of the third class. Then for the fourth class, we're going to do 185 plus 224 divided by 2 to get 204.5. Then for the next one, we're going to take 225 plus 264 divided by 2 gives us 244.5. Then for the next one, 265 plus 304 divided by 2 gives us 284.5. Then for the last one, 305 plus 344 divided by 2 is 324.5. Next, we're going to find the relative frequencies of each class. To find the relative frequencies, you're going to take the frequency of that individual class and you are going to divide it by the sample size n. Back when we first did this problem, the sample size here was equal to 30. It gave it, you know, way back here, right there. There's 30 GPS units. So for the relative frequency of the first class, we're going to take the class's frequency 6, and we're going to divide it by the sample size 30. And we get a relative frequency of 0.2, which, if you want to turn that into a percent, is 20%. So what that means is 20% of the original data falls in the first class. To find the relative frequency of the second class, we're going to take that class's frequency 9, and we're going to divide it by the sample size 30, and we get 0.3. So what this means is 30% of the original data falls in the second class. Then the relative frequency of the third class is going to be 6 divided by 30, 30, which is 0.2 again. So 20% of the original data falls in the third class. Then for the relative frequency of the fourth class, we're going to take the class frequency 4. We're going to divide it by the sample size 30, and we get 0.13. So 13% of the original data falls in the fourth class. Then for the next class, we're going to take the class frequency 2, divided by the sample size 30, and we get 0.07. So this is about 7% of the original data falls in, the, uh, in this fifth class. Then for the uh, relative frequency of the sixth class, we're going to take its class frequency 1 divided by the sample size 30, and we get 0.03. So 3% of the original data falls in the sixth class. 
And then the relative frequency for the seventh and last class is 0.7. So 7% 7 of the data falls in the last class. Then we're going to look at the cumulative frequency. For the cumulative frequency, we're going to take the frequency of that class and add to it all of the frequencies that came before it. So the cumulative frequency for the first class is just going to be its original class frequency 6. But for the cumulative frequency of the second class, we're going to take its class frequency 9, and we're going to add to it the frequencies of all the classes that came before it, giving us a cumulative frequency of 15. Then for the cumulative frequency of this third class, we're going to take its class frequency 6 and add up all the frequencies that came before it, which gives us 21. So the cumulative frequency of the third class is 21. Then for the cumulative frequency of the fourth class, we're going to take its class frequency 4. We're going to add to it the frequencies of all the classes that came before it, giving us a cumulative frequency of 25. Then for the next one, the class frequency plus the frequencies that came before it gave us a cumulative frequency of 27. Then for the sixth class, its cumulative frequency is going to be 28. And remember that the cumulative frequency of the last class should be equal to the sample size, which it is. So a couple of things, conclusions that we can draw just by looking at this data. Let's look at the relative frequencies. You can see it both from the original table and from the relative frequency. Which class has the most G, has the most data? The second class. The second class had the highest frequency, and it had the highest relative frequency. So that means that the class that has the highest percentage of the data is the second class. And if you take a look, 0.2, 0 0.3, and 0 0.2, if you add those together, you get 0.7. So 70% of the data falls in the first three classes. And even if you just look at the first two, 0.2 plus 0.3, that's 50%. So 50% of the original data just fell in the first two classes. So 50% of the data has a price range between $65 and $144. And you can see it by the cumulative frequencies as well. Remember that the sample size was 30. The cumulative frequency of the second class is 15. That's half the data. So half the data falls between the first and the second classes. So half of the data has already been accumulated by the time you get to the end of the second class. Now, what class had the lowest frequency? Well, that was the sixth class. It had a frequency of 1, had a relative frequency of 0.3. Only 3% of the data fell on that class. So you can draw a lot of those conclusions just by looking at that data. You can also say that you can also interpret it as, you know, half of these GPS units cost $144 or less. So most common price range is $105 to $144. So just by looking at these different features, we can at least draw some very basic conclusions about the data that we may not have been able to see just by looking at the giant blob of numbers that was the original data. That's the whole purpose of these frequency tables and organizing the data in this way so that you can see patterns and you can group values together. Now, you can display frequency distributions either in those frequency tables or you can make a graph. So the graph of a frequency distribution is called a frequency histogram. A frequency histogram is a bar graph that represents the frequency distribution of that data set. And since this is a graph, we're going to have two axes, an x-axis, which is the horizontal axis, and the y-axis, which is the vertical axis. So the x-axis, or the horizontal axis, is quantitative, numeric, and measures the data entries. So that's going to be the data entries in question. We're going to be doing it for the GPS units, so in that case it will be prices of the GPS units. The y-axis, or vertical axis, is also quantitative and measures the frequencies of that class. Now in a frequency histogram, the bars have to touch. You might have seen bar graphs where the bars do not touch. Those are called Pareto graphs, and those uh, are graphs of, quant of qualitative 
data, we're not going to be looking at those here. This is purely quantitative data, so this is purely numeric data. So in a histogram, the bars have to touch. So because the bars have to touch, in a histogram, class boundaries exist mathematically. So even if you draw a graph using either Excel or a graphing calculator or whatever other technology, the class boundaries are always going to exist. And class boundaries are only used when drawing histograms. Class boundaries do not apply to the frequency tables. Class boundaries are only used for graphing. The class boundaries are the numbers that separate the classes on the graph without forming any gaps. The class boundaries are what allow the bars to touch. So to find the lower class boundaries for the purposes of graphing, you are going to subtract 0.5 from each lower class limit. Then to find the upper class boundaries, you're going to add 0.5 to each upper class limit. What this will do is it will make the bar for one class share a side with a bar from the other class. So there will be no gaps or overlaps between those because you're only subtracting and adding exactly 0.5 to each lower class bound limit and upper class limit. But it will allow each class to share a side and each bar to share a side so that there are no gaps and they touch. So the horizontal axis of the frequency histogram is the data of interest, and you can either label it by the class boundaries, or it can be labeled by the class midpoints, and it doesn't really matter which one you use, you can label it by either. So what we're going to do first is we're going to find the class boundaries because even if you label the horizontal axis with the midpoints, the class boundaries still mathematically exist. You just may not use them as labels, but mathematically they will still be there. So we're going to find the class boundaries and then we're going to use that to draw a frequency histogram for the frequency distribution of GPS units, which I have recreated here. And then we're going to use that graph to describe any patterns that we can see. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to find the class boundaries. The class boundaries Again, you only do this when graphing. You do not have to do this when making a normal frequency table. This is just for drawing histograms. To find the class boundaries, you're going to subtract 0.5 from each lower class limit and add 0.5 to each upper class limit. So I'm going to take 65 minus 0.5 gives me a class boundary of 64.5. 2, 104 plus 0.5 is 104.5. So those are the class boundaries of the first class. To find the class boundaries for the second class, we're going to do the same thing. So to find the lower class boundary, I'm going to take 105 minus 0.5, which is 104.5. Then I'm going to take 144 plus 0.5, I'm going to, and that's going to be 144.5. Now notice how the upper class boundary of the first class is the same as the lower class boundary for the second class. This should happen. This is what makes the bars touch. So then for the third class, 144 minus 0.5 is 144.5. Then 184 plus 0.5 is 184.5. So again, this upper class boundary and this lower class boundary are the same. There's no gaps between them and they match up perfectly so the bars will touch perfectly. Then the boundaries for the next class are going to be 184.5 to 224.5. Then add and subtract 0 0.5 for the next lower uh, the next class boundary so that'll be 224.5 to 264.5. And then for the next class it's going to be 264.5 to 304.5. Then for the next one, it's going to be 304.5 to 344.5. So when you're drawing your graph, if I ever ask you to draw a graph by hand, I'm not looking for a masterpiece here. You can draw more accurate graphs on your homework platform, my stat lab, and the graphs will be beautiful and computer generated. If I ever ask you to do something by hand, I am not looking for perfection. I'm not looking for an artistic masterpiece. I'm just looking for the correct features. So remember, this is a graph. 
graphs are in the xy plane. They look something like this, and we have four quadrants here. However, if you really think about it, are there any negatives here? The, the prices aren't negative, the frequencies aren't negative. So of the four quadrants in the coordinate plane, we really only need the first one. So we're really just going to draw the first quadrant, which will look something like this. So we're going to have an x-axis and a y-axis. Now remember, a lot of flashbacks to graphing back from algebra. What is the point in the center? The point in the center is 0, 0. So technically, your graph would start at 0, 0. Now, your scales for your x and y axis do not have to be the same. They can be different depending on your needs. Since the frequencies you know, are only between 1 and 9, a scale of 1 for the y axis probably would be pretty reasonable. However, would a scale of 1 for the x axis, which is going to be the prices, would that really be realistic? Probably not. And in fact, the scale that you use for the x-axis can vary, and you can pick whatever scale you think is best. However, one thing, though, is you know normally the first quadrant would be graphed something like this, where both the x and the y-axis would start at 0. However, take a look at the classes. The first class starts at 65. The lowest price for those GPS units was $65. So we have absolutely no data between 0 and 65. So regardless of the scale you use, you're going to have a massive gap between 0 and 65 with absolutely no data there. So when you have a gap like that, here's what you can do. You can take all of that graph, all of that piece of the x-axis that has absolutely no data, and you can kind of scrunch it down like this. You're basically making an accordion out of it. You're taking everything between 0 and 65 that has absolutely no data, and you are scrunching it down. And we can even label this as 64.5, which is the lower class boundary for the first class. So by doing this, you are indicating that, yes, there is graph here, but no, there is no data here. So let's put our labels on here. So the x-axis is going to be, I'm going to start with labeling it by the class boundaries. However, even though I'm labeling it by the class boundaries, I do need to label what those class boundaries stand for. They stand for the prices of the GPS units. And the y-axis, which I didn't leave myself a whole ton of room for, the y-axis is going to be the frequencies. Now, graphs mean nothing without a table. I know it's kind of easy to get all caught up in the math and forget these little Englishy things like writing the title, but you do need to have a, a title for the graph in order for the graph to mean anything. So the title is going to be the price of the GPS units. And now I am going to draw the best graph that I can with this glitchy stylus, and we're going to see how it goes. So I'm going to continue to label my x-axis with the class boundaries. So the next class boundary is going to be 104.5. And then next class boundary is going to be 144.5. Pretend that's a 144.5. Then the next class boundary is going to be 184.5. You know, I'm not even going to try. To, I mean, yeah, I'm not even going to keep trying. This is too glitchy for this. And then the next one's going to be 264.5. I say as I continue to draw. And then, you know, we have 304.5 and then 344.5. Again, I just labeled it by the class boundaries. I'm going to post a cleaner version of this on Canvas. That is going to be much easier to see. I am very sorry. So if you want a more legible version of this graph, just go on Canvas. I will post it under the module with this video. Now for frequencies, our frequencies are only between 1 and 9, so it would make sense to have a scale of 1 for the y-axis. Doing the best I can with this. And then what we're going to do is we're going to make our bars. So the first class has class boundaries between 164 and 104.5. So the bar is going to extend from here to here. 
the height of the bar is going to be its frequency, 6. So the height of the bar is going to go up here, so the bar will look something like this. That was nowhere near as bad as I thought it was going to be. Now the next class, remember the bars have to touch, so the next class is going to share a side with the first bar. So the first bar is going to go from, sorry, the second bar is going to go from 104.5 to 144.5 and it is going to have a height of 9, so it will look something like this. Third bar is going to share the side with 144.5 and it's going to go to 184.5 and it too is going to have a height of 6. Next bar is going to go from 184.5, sharing the same side, to 224.5, and it will have a height of 4. Then from 224.5 to 264.5, that bar is going to have a height of 2. Next bar is going to have a height of 1. Pretend these are the same width. And then the last bar is going to have a height of 2. So that is the best that I can do with the limited technology that I have right now. But you get the idea. Now another option that you could have used instead of labeling it with the class boundaries would have been to label it with the class midpoints. So let me just you know, do another color here. You do not have to label it with both. Pick, in fact, don't. Don't label it with both. I just don't feel like drawing a whole new graph just to show you what it would look like labeled with class midpoints. So it with class midpoints, you know, instead of using the class boundaries, you would use the class midpoints. So this would be, you know, 184.5. This would be 124.5. I have no idea what happened there, but again, I'm going to post a cleaner version on Canvas. But you can either label it with the class boundaries or with the class midpoints, and it really doesn't make a difference. But this is what the frequency histograms look like. They are bar graphs where the bars touch. Now, just based on the visual, just looking at it, what class has the highest frequency? Well, that would be $105 to $144. So since this second bar here is the highest, that means it has the highest frequency, so the highest percentage of GPS units uh, uh, sorry, the highest percentage of GPS units have the have prices between $105 and $144. The one that's the lowest is 265 to 304. So the purpose of histograms is to just provide a visual tool so that you can look at these, you know, you can look at this and quickly see patterns, which is the highest, which is the lowest, where do most of the GP, where does most of the data appear to be clustered? Well, most of it looks to be between, you know, this first bar and this third bar etc. Now another type of histogram that you can make is what is called a relative frequency histogram. So a relative frequency histogram is a bar graph and it's the same, the same concept as this it, but instead of the y-axis being labeled with frequencies, it's labeled with relative frequencies. So in a relative frequency histogram it would go you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 all the way up to 1 and you know, it would be the exact same concept with the class boundaries and the bars touching, but instead of the class frequency, you would just use the relative class frequency. Now, I'm not going to try and incorporate the calculator instructions on how to on how to draw a histogram on a graphing calculator into this video because I think if I try to open that program right now I'm going to crash this computer. So the I have already gone ahead and recorded the calculator steps on how to draw a histogram on a graphing calculator in another video and I'm going to leave a link to that video in the description. So just take a moment after this to go and view that video because it walks you through how to enter your data into a calculator and how to construct a histogram on a TI-83 or TI-84. Now the only thing which I do point out in, the, in that video is if you have data in your graphing calculator that you need to clear out to enter data, to clear lists, do not press the delete button. Use the clear button. If you accidentally press the delete button and you delete a list by accident, just email me and I'll walk you through how to do it. It's annoying, so just save yourself the agony. Do not press delete when you are clearing a list. Use the clear button. So again, for those instructions, go see that video. The link is in the description. 
Now for this next section, we're going to we're not going to look at too many graphs of qualitative data sets, but we are going to look at specifically pie charts. There are a bunch of those, you have Pareto charts, etc., but we're going to look at specifically pie charts. Pie charts, we've all seen them before. It is a circle that is divided into sectors and each sector represents a specific category. And the size of each sector is proportional to the frequency of each category. If you don't remember what a sector is, a sector is a slice of a circle. So a sector is a region that is between two radii of a circle. So that would be a sector. So the size of the sector is proportional to the size of the category. The larger the frequency of that category, the larger the sector. The smaller the frequency of that category, the smaller the sector. Now, all of the categories do need to add up to 100%. And these categories represent the percentages, though the percentages for each category are the relative frequencies of each category. Remember, relative frequency is the class's frequency divided by the sample size. Now, the size of the sector, how big or small that sector is, since the sector is just the area between two radii, the area of that sector is determined by what is called a central angle. A central angle on a circle is an angle that has a vertex at the center and it's between two of the radii. So this would be the central angle. The size of the sector is determined by the size of the central angle. So to find the measure of that central angle, which will give you the size of each sector, you're going to multiply the relative frequency as a decimal, not a percent, by 360 degrees. Remember, 360 degrees is what all the angles in a circle need to add up to. So to find that central angle, you take the relative frequency as a decimal and you multiply it by 360 degrees. Now, even though most pie charts you are going to be making by hand, it is important to know why the sectors are the size that they are and where the size of each sector comes from. So yes, we are going to be drawing a pie chart by hand. It's not going to be perfect, but we're going to go through the process by hand just so that you can see why each sector is sized the way it is. And it's all dependent on that measure of the central angle. So this graph, this chart here, represents the earned degrees that were conferred in 2011 and it's broken down by the type of degree. Remember type of degree, this is qualitative data. We have associates, bachelors, masters, and doctoral. And then the number of those degrees for each category in thousands, you do not need to add all the zeros. This is just representing the number in thousands. So there were 942,000 associates degrees conferred in 2011, etc. And what we're going to do is we're going to make a pie chart of this data. So the first thing that we need to do is we need the sample size. We are not expressly given the sample size. So what we need to do is we need to add together all of these frequencies. So if you add together all of those frequencies, you get 3,553. So that is going to be the total. You're going to use that as the denominator for each of your relative frequencies. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first find the relative frequencies for, oh God, for each category. So let's start with the associates degrees. So for the associates degrees, I'm going to find the relative frequency by taking the frequency of that category, 942, and dividing it by the total, 3,553. So if you do 942 divided by 3,553, you should get a relative frequency of approximately 2, uh, 0.265. Then for the bachelor's degrees, I'm going to do the same thing. So I'm going to take the frequency of that category, 1,716. Then I'm going to divide it by the total, 3,553 gives us a relative frequency for the bachelor's degrees of 0.483. Then for the relative frequencies for the master's degrees, I'm going to take the number of master's degrees, 731, divided by the total, 3,553, to give us a relative frequency of 0.206. Then for the doctorals, I'm going to take the frequency 
164 divided by the total 3,553 gives us a relative frequency of 0 0.046. Then once you get the relative frequencies for each category, you are going to find the measure of that central angle for each category that will determine the size of the sector. So remember, to find the measure of that central angle, you're going to multiply the relative frequency as a decimal by 360 degrees. So for this first one, I'm going to take 265. I'm going to multiply it by 360. Gives us a central angle of approximately 95 degrees. Again, I rounded. It's very approximate, but it's approximately 95 degrees. Then for the bachelor's, you're going to take its relative frequency, 0.483. Then you're going to divide it, uh, sorry, you're going to multiply it by 360 degrees. Gives you a central angle of approximately 174 degrees. Then you're going to take the master's 0 0.206, multiply it by 360 degrees. Gives you a central angle for this sector of 74 degrees. Then for this last one, you're going to take 0.4. A 0 0.046, multiply it by 360 degrees, and you should get a angle of approximately 17 degrees. Again, I'm going to post a cleaner version of this on Canvas so that you can see it a little better. So now, again, if I ever ask for a graph by hand, I'm not looking for a masterpiece. We're going to pretend that's a circle, and then we're going to draw each of our sectors. Let's start with the largest one, 174 degrees. So picture a 174 degree angle. I mean, it's almost 180 degrees. It's almost halfway down the circle, but not quite. So, I mean, that's not, that's not the best. Hold on a second. Let's try that again. So 174 degrees, approximately something like that. So if you take a look at this, take a look at the relative frequency, 0.483. That's almost 50%. So almost 50% or almost half of the data was in the bachelor's category. That's why this sector is so large. That's why this angle is almost halfway down the circle. It's almost 180 degrees. Because the relative frequency is so close to 50%, the central angle was very close to half of the circle, 180 degrees. And that's why the bachelor's category takes up almost half the circle. So even though this is the only pie chart we're going to make by hand, that's why we're doing this so that you can see the relationship between the relative frequency and the size of the sector. So the bachelor's degrees, we're going to label it as 48.3%. So 48.3% of the degrees conferred in 2011 were bachelor's degrees. And remember, to turn a decimal into a percent, you just multiply it by 100. So then let's go to the next largest category, which is the associate's degrees. So the associate's degrees is a 95 degree angle. Well, we all know what a 90 degree angle looks like. That's a right angle. So a 95 degree angle looks something like that. So for the associate's degree category, let's turn this relative frequency into a percent by multiplying by 100. So we have 26.5%. A 90 degree angle would be a quarter of the circle. This relative frequency is just over 25%. It's just over a quarter. So that's why the angle was just over a quarter of the circle. It was just above 90 degrees because the relative frequency was about 26% or just over a quarter. So that's why that sector is sized the way it is. Next, let's go to the master's degrees, which is a 70 four degree angle, 74 degree angle looks something like that. So for the master's degrees, that had a relative frequency of 20.6%. And then for the doctoral category, that looks like about a, 70, a 17 degree angle. The doctorate degrees is going to be 4.6%. So because the doctoral degree had such a low relative frequency, that's why the 
angle is so small and that's why the sector is so small. So that is a pie chart which is one of the graphs of qualitative data. Now the last type of graph that we're going to cover in this section is called a scatter plot. And a scatter plot is a graph of what is called a paired data set. So a paired data set is actually when there are two data sets and they correspond to each other. So a paired data set happens when each data entry in one set of data directly corresponds one on one to uh, two entries in a second data set. So a scatter plot is a graph of a paired data set. A scatter plot are disconnected points that are ordered pairs from the paired data set. So the x coordinate is the data entry from the first data set and the y coordinate is its corresponding data entry in the second data set. And notice in scatter plots the points are disconnected. Do not draw line segments between these. You are drawing a line graph. That's a totally different thing. Scatter plots are disconnected points. And these points are graphed in the coordinate plane, so same xy plane that we drew the frequency histogram. And what these graphs show are the relationship between two quantitative variables from two corresponding data sets. We're going to be doing scatter plots a lot more extensively toward the end of this course, and we're going to draw a lot more scatter plots and look a lot more at paired data sets. But I'm just introducing the concept now and introducing this type of graph now because you will see uh, scatter plots kind of sprinkled throughout this course. So this here is an example of a paired data set. We have the numbers of hours watching TV, which is going to be the variable X, and we have corresponding text score, test scores, which is going to be the variable Y. And if you notice, each individual entry in the X data set corresponds with one data entry in the Y data set. So we have zero hours watching TV corresponded to a test score of 96. So in a paired data set to graph this, we're going to turn this into an ordered pair, 0, 96. Then one hour watching TV corresponded with a test score of 85, so we're going to turn this into 1, 85. For the next one, two hours watching TV had a test score of 82, so we have 2, 82. And yes, in paired data sets, you can have an X coordinate occur more than once. So this just means that there were two different people that each watched three hours of TV and they had two different test scores. So this first person that had three hours of TV had a test score of 74. The second person that had three hours of TV had a test score of 95. Then there were three different people that each had five hours of TV with, five, with three different test scores. So we have 5, 68. Then we have 5, 76. And then 5, 58. So in a scatter plot, it's going to be basically the same idea. It's going to be graphed in the XY plane. However, since we do not have any negatives here, we're only really going to be focusing on the first quadrant. And remember, the first quadrant starts here at 0, 0, and you can have different scales for your x and your y axis depending on the data. A scale for the x axis, it does make sense that the x axis would go by 1 since we only have entries between 1 and 5. However, for the y axis, you know, let's say a scale of 5 might be more useful. However, what does appear to be the lowest test score? Well, the lowest test score does appear to be about 58. So we have absolutely no data between 0 and 58. So instead of having a gigantic gap with nothing between 0 and 58, I'm going to do another one of those accordion scrunches. And I'm going to make this start at 55. And I'm going to go by 5. So we're going to have 55, then we're going to have 60, and then 65, 70, 75, 80, 85, 90, 95, 100. And then for the x-axis, we're just going to go by 1. So we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 
Now remember, your X and your Y axis do need labels. So the X axis was hours of TV. And the Y axis was test scores. And remember that graphs mean nothing without a title, so you do need to remember a title. So we're going to call this TV and test scores or whatever title seems to make the most sense to you. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take each of these ordered pairs and I'm going to plot them as points. Remembering, do not draw any lines between these because that creates a di totally different graph. So 0, 96. 0, 96 is approximately right there. We're going to make our points nice and bold and easy to see. 1, 85 is right there. 2, 82 is approximately right there. Then we have 3, 74. Again, if you're drawing something by hand, I'm not looking for perfection. We also have 3, 95, which is approximately right up here. And then we have 5, 68, which is, you know, right, right there. Then we have 5, 76 and 5, 58. So you get the idea that a scatter plot is a plot of disconnected points that represent a paired data set. Now there is a way to draw a scatter plot on a TI-83 or TI-84, and we're going to go way more in depth on how to do this later. Here are the calculator steps for now. I will leave a link to that other video, to this video of how to draw a scatter plot in the description. Just remember that we're not going to really be doing a whole ton of this right now. We're going to be doing way more scatter plots later on in the course. So don't worry too much about this. Focus on the histograms. That's what a lot of your homework questions are about. So that is it for graphs and displays. So thank you all very much for watching. These are the graphs and displays that we're going to be covering in this course. The rest of this chapter is going to be about different features of the data set, such as center and spread, that we're going to be taking a look at. So thank you all very much for watching, and I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.